So the rhetoric around climate change has heated up considerably in the past month or so, uh, pun intended. Uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says that we're no longer in the era of global warming, but the era of global boiling. You regularly read uh, newspaper headlines telling us that the world is on fire. Uh, you know, we're going to burst into flames at any moment. I mean, Candice, what have you made of this? Should we take this seriously? Should we be should we be afraid? <laughs> no, and that's the problem. I mean, when you when you start talking like this, and and that's like absolute worst case scenario. I mean, mm. that's like the runaway greenhouse effect that you, we've seen on Venus, for instance. Yeah. Then immediately people just become gripped by fear. Mm. They become gripped by fear. Instead of being able to talk rationally about mitigation, that actually there are things that we can do. But I feel like the environmental movement has become gripped by this emotionalism. It's been going on for a long time. It's led to many splits. I mean, Patrick Moore, one of the founders of Greenpeace, has become a big critic of this particular tactic that they have. Mm. But I also I also think it's very counterproductive. I think it turns people off. I think people don't like it at all. As, at all. It's like when, with Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion, public opinion is very much to get, very much against them. Yeah. People don't like being made to feel afraid like this. They actually really resent it. Luke, what have you what have you made of sort of ramping up of the rhetoric? Because it just feels like it's always been bad, but now it just feels divorced from, from reality completely. Well, I accept myself the challenge of finding out what global boiling is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, apparently the definition that I was able to find um, is that it's a combination of global warming with the El Nino effect, the mm. hot wind coming in um, and unusually hot weather. But at, at its bottom, it is just something invented by Antonio Gutierrez. That's it. Yeah. It's just an idea that he came up with in a speech and then people start using it. Mm. And it is fascinating to think this is a completely unscientific term. It's worth noting also that they suggest that we are now in the era of yeah, global boiling. Yeah. It's like something has changed mm. and we are in it. We are there. And there is just nothing to suggest that the science now is any different than it was 12 months ago. It yeah. is propaganda. Now, there is, of course, an absolute case that we need to deal with when it comes to global warming. You know, there are issues we have. To, it's an issue we have to deal with. But what is really problematic is that, as Candice suggests, this kind of language of fear, mm. this language that it is out of control, this language that, there, uh, that, that suggests there is only one way to respond, yeah. which is what the UN thinks we should do, i.e. cut back, impose limits, shut things down, decarbonize, degrowth, net zero. All of this is a political response to a question. Yeah. Uh, what do we do about climate change? And they are using language and propaganda to push that particular agenda. And it's not the only response to the problem. And, and often what's bizarre is that they're wrong about the specifics. So if you think about fires, for instance, the world being on fire, it's true. You know, we have in Europe, there has been a pretty horrendous summer of fires. But if you take a kind of the global picture, it's just not true that there are more fires than there were before. You know, it seemed to peak around the year 2000, around 3% of the world was uh, burnt in that year, which is, you know, sounds quite terrifying, but I don't think people were scared of it back in 2000. Um, and it's been going down ever since because whatever the weather is throwing at us, whatever, whether temperatures are going up or not, we as human beings are getting much better at managing these problems. We are really good at managing um, natural disasters. We're better at preventing floods. You know, the amount of floods that might have happened that we don't even have to think about because we just have the techniques for stopping these from happening is extraordinary. There's a positive story there. Yes. But absolutely. we can't we can't celebrate it. We we just we're supposed to just be afraid and think that the world is going to end and you know we have no future. It is. It's it's almost it's it's cult-like. But it's also this sort of pre-enlightenment mysticism, you know, mm. that we have no control over the environment. It governs us. You know, we almost need to pay obeisance. We've angered the gods of yeah. nature. And I found it very interesting. And I, I didn't think I would ever refer to Alan Titchmarch on a political debate. But did you see recently he's been speaking against the whole rewilding mm. phenomenon? And he actually says no human beings cultivating the earth and having gardens is actually better for wildlife yeah. because we extend the whole pollination season rather than just, you know, there being three months that bees can get pollen from flowers. And he's, he's speaking against this idea, I think, that human beings can only ever have a negative mm. impact 
on the environment and we always have to retreat from it because we're hurting it when actually the opposite is true. Um, and I think what's interesting as well is there's all this alarmist re rhetoric at the same time that there's growing skepticism yeah. around net zero. And people are actually starting to look at it and say, hang on a minute, is this the right solution? I'm not sure it's worth it. I don't want to lose my living standards. And that's basically what they're proposing. Because you are seeing, starting to see things bubble up, particularly in Europe. I mean, if you think, or in the UK, you know, we had the revolts uh, in Uxbridge against ULES, where Labour really should have won that seat, but were uh, the useless Tories were given, um, you know, voters used the Tories to give Labour a kicking instead of the government. You've had Dutch farmers protests, you've had the Gilets jaunes, all, all related to environmental taxes and things like that. You know, can net zero really survive contact with the public when people realise how punishing it is? Well, I would, I would throw into the mix road closures. So yeah. in my local area, we've had low traffic neighbourhoods mm. and it means that posh roads are closed down and all the traffic is literally, in the case of Waltham Forest, driven down uh, a poorer road. Yeah. <laughs> so all the exhaust and, and traffic is literally moved from a posh bit of the uh, borough to a poorer bit. And of course, you have people tweeting saying, What's wrong with low traffic neighbourhoods? My road is now so quiet. Yeah. My children can play football in the middle of the road without having to worry about cars. I can hear church bells and there are, there are bells. maids milking in the, the, in the middle of the street. And, and, and they just completely ignore the fact that the traffic has to go somewhere. Yeah. And of course, the traffic is going down the road where the poorer people live. That is actually happening in Waltham Forest. And you see this time and time again with environmental policy, that when it comes up against the brutal fact of modern life, mm. if you can call it that, when it comes up to the pra when the practical implications of these policies are put in front of people, people rightly reject them, and their elitist uh, character can be seen. Yeah, and in, in no case is that more clear than in road closures. Definitely, yeah. And there's this very strange. I think the car issue is fascinating because if you go on Twitter um, and you look up what people are saying about ULES, look up what people are saying about low traffic neighbourhoods, and you'd get the impression that driving was this kind of strange niche pursuit of sort of weird petrol heads and, you know, Jeremy Clarkson types, and they're probably racist too, I'm sure, um, rather than the main mode of transport for the people of this country. You know, there's 40 million registered drivers, it's like 88% of all journeys are taken by car. Yes. And yet pretty much everyone involved in policy making circles, they're against the car. They think it's actually a good thing if people stop driving. They're in favor, they say they're in favor of ULES because they want to save our lungs or something like that, or they want to save the planet. But really, they're quite happy that it would stop people driving. Completely ideologically driven. Most people have to do the school run every day. Mm. They have to get to work using their car. They get that's how they get their shopping. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, trying to like go about five different buses to pick kids up from nursery or to get an elderly relative to the hospital. I mean, yeah. how are you going to do that? I mean, it's just so poorly thought through. It's actually shocking. And it's it's crazy that even <laughs> needs to be said. I know. That's how kind of distant uh, these policies are. I mean, it is, at the end of the day, look, it is kind of um, an obsession of an elite. There isn't um, ordinary people, you know, in say the Red Wall towns aren't coming out saying we want net zero, give us more wind farms. <laughs> well, the, the, they're certainly not saying that. They're certainly not saying close our road to make low traffic yeah. neighbourhoods. They're certainly not saying we want you, Les. Mm. You know, when you put these um, policies up for democratic pressure, as we've seen in Uxbridge, they get rejected roundly. And I think politicians need to start taking notice. But the costs are huge. I mean, for things like heat pumps, I think most people cannot afford that. It's something like £10,000 to install yeah. a heat pump. I mean, how do they expect people to find money for that? It's £10,000 to install a heat pump, which is not as good as your gas boiler. It'll take you all day to heat it to the correct temperature. And then you probably also need to have your home re-insulated or, you know, redone because it's not up to the right spec for the heat pumps to work. You need to replace all your radiators because they need bigger radiators. And that's just one aspect of it. Net zero is going to affect every area of our lives. So heat pumps, you know, we can say that's ridiculous, but then it's going to affect the way we travel. Um, it's going to affect agriculture. It's going to affect how we could produce our energy, how we construct buildings even uh, is considered environmentally unsound. And yet no one seems to have either thought this through, um, thought about the kind of punishing implications of this um, and They've certainly not consulted the public on whether we want it. Yes, and it's like we've been talking about these laws have been passed without any real consent from the public, very little debate like you wrote about mm. in your, your spiked article, 
and a lot of in, in a lot of cases the technology isn't even there yeah. so we could end up having this really chaotic transition in 2030 and then the net zero deadlines coming up in 2050 and it's law mm. and we don't we, we don't even know if we'll be able to achieve it properly it's a crazy situation and you just hope that you know enough people rise up uh, against it and we can put a stop to it before it causes real pain